I'm going to talk about is an overview of chronic fatigue syndrome, results of our human and virus gene studies, our efforts to develop a diagnostic test, and uh, our plans for clinical trials of new treatments. So there's already been some talk today about the best uh, case definitions to use, and I'm afraid we've used the CDC criteria. <clears throat> but we have also uh, characterized our patients according to this paper, which is the recommendations of the International CFS Study Group. And this um, recommends more rigorous exclusion of other diseases and additional characterization of associated symptoms. So according to the CDC, CFS is a syndrome of unexplained fatigue of new onset, lasting more than six months, not related to exercise, and not relieved by rest. The case definition requires the presence of four or more of these uh, additional symptoms and the exclusion of other physical and psychiatric causes. You there is... Sorry, Jonathan, to interrupt. I think you need to speak up. Speak up, OK. Thank you. There is currently no laboratory test. So in our studies, we had to visit uh, quite a few patients in their homes because many CFS patients, as you know, are uh, bed-bound and uh, cannot leave the house for any significant length of time. The epidemiology shows that uh, there is a prevalence of 0.5%, that the disease is more common in females, typically has a sudden onset, which probably reflects virus infections. <clears throat> And it's been shown that there is preceding virus infection and laboratory documented evidence of that. Many patients report a flu-like illness that never goes away. Outbreaks have been um, reported. And if we follow specific virus infections uh, with time, we can see that a certain percentage of these go on to develop chronic fatigue syndrome. In addition, uh, it's important that uh, exposure to toxins, chemicals, pesticides, and vaccination is also here. And importantly as well, there is pre-existing emotional stress. There have been many studies of pathogenesis. <clears throat> Probably number one on this list is abnormalities of the immune system. And there are various abnormalities documented, for example, increased levels of immune complexes, um, increased levels of IgG, etc. Consistently, there is depressed NK or natural killer cell function or NK cell numbers. And there, are, there is a Th2 phenotype in the disease as well. Infection is also very important and viruses and some bacteria are known to trigger the disease and may also perpetuate it through persistent modes of infection. And um, Malcolm mentioned John Chia from California. This is uh, his study, 2003, where he examined uh, 200 CFS patients who presented to his infectious disease clinic and thoroughly investigated them for evidence of persistent infections. And uh, he managed to show uh, evidence of persistent infection in three quarters of these cases. And number one on the list was enteroviruses, which we've heard a lot about today. In addition, chlamydia and pneumonia, which causes a chest infection uh, in the acute phase, um, Epstein-Barr virus, uh, varicella zoster virus, parvovirus B19, et cetera, et cetera. Some of these cases followed uh, vaccination, toxic mold exposure, et cetera. So this little um, diagram is an invention of mine to illustrate the possible ways that the disease may be caused. It seems there are a variety of initial in insults, which may each be followed by an individual or possibly common initial process. And these may come together to uh, form final common pathways, which may be responsible for the perpetuation of the disease. There are many treatments, as we know, um, but none of these are specific, except for the one at the bottom here. 
which is specific treatment of virus infection, if it's possible to diagnose that in an individual. So we were frustrated by the lack of uh, insight and progress into the disease mechanisms in this disease. And in 2002, uh, we formed a collaborative study group to look at the hypothesis that abnormalities of gene expression occur in chronic fatigue syndrome. And we applied and were awarded a grant by the CFS Research Foundation, which is a small independent charity based in Hertfordshire. And we studied 25 CFS patients and 25 normal controls. And these were diagnosed according to the CDC criteria. And we took blood from these and analyzed their gene levels using a microarray. And the array we used was one made by NimbleGen, which represented 9,500 genes. So we analyzed all the uh, gene levels in the patients and compared them with the gene levels in the controls and we found that uh, 35 were different. And when we tested using PCR, this was brought down to 16. So it might be helpful before we get into the details of that to run over basic cell processes for those who aren't familiar. And this shows the process in, that occurs in almost every cell. This is the DNA sequence up here, and we inherit this sequence from our parents. And the sequence of DNA is specific and unique to each of us and doesn't change probably throughout our lives. Day to day, moment to moment, the DNA is what we call transcribed into RNA, messenger RNA, which encodes the genes. And while the DNA molecule is very uh, stable and doesn't change over time, the, the RNA molecule is very unstable. And so if we look at the RNA, we can see a snapshot of the cell's basic functions at that particular time. And that's why we looked at RNA as opposed to DNA. So this shows somebody holding a glass slide, a standard glass slide that is used in most laboratories, on which has been made or synthesized a, a, a microarray. And basically, this consists of many thousands of little probes, each with a specific sequence that binds to RNA sequences in the patient's sample. And after the test has been done, what we get for each person is a grid of little colored lights and dots. And the bright ones indicate a high level of that particular gene, and the intermediate ones an intermediate level, and the very dim ones or um, dark areas indicate probably no level of that gene. And then it's important that we have to test the genes that were identified by the microarray using a different method. And in this case, we used polymerase chain reaction. Now, while the microarray looks at lots of genes at once, the PCR looks at one gene at a time. And this shows the rise in the uh, amount of the particular gene level with the PCR test. And the time of detection, the time of the rise, tells us the amount of the gene. And we compare the uh, amount of test gene, or the time of detection of the test gene here, with the time of detection of the control gene here. And it's that so-called normalized value that we use in further analysis. And for our studies, we use this um, card methodology, which is produced by applied biosystems, which facilitates a very high throughput of samples and a very large number of PCR tests. So what genes did we find? Well, they're listed here. And they're categorized according to these general functions. Genes of particular interest were those affecting the immune system and T cell activation, these three at the top. NTE is the target for organophosphate pesticides and chemicals, which we've heard something about today. EIF4G1 is the target for various viruses to bind and to cleave this protein. And this provides a very interesting virus connection to this study. <clears throat> 
And this gene is involved in the production of messenger RNA itself. So this gene is involved in the production of other genes, if you like. So we concluded from this that uh, our hypothesis had been proven, that there were differences between patients and controls, that the study suggested a complex pathogenesis where there was more than one mechanism and maybe more than three or four, and supports a biological process in chronic fatigue syndrome as opposed to a psychological one. And this was the foundation for us to take this work further. So we developed a working model of chronic fatigue syndrome based on the immune system and on virus infections and other insults. So this, this shows the antigen presenting cells which occur in the blood and in the tissues. And when viruses infect us, and they're represented by these colored circles, they are taken up by these macrophages which digest them partially and present the antigenic subunits to the other cells of the immune system, which then become activated and produce cytokines and other molecules which cause um, inflammation and which mediate the immune response. But we believe this process goes on for a very long time in chronic fatigue syndrome patients. So what are the human and virus gene signatures of chronic fatigue syndrome? And how should we examine this? Well, to take this further, we decided to repeat the first study using a larger number of patients and controls and determine the levels of all human and virus genes that we possibly could. And we did this using two parallel studies. The first was a repeat microarray study using a very, very large microarray representing the maximum uh, number of human genes and their variants that it's possible to measure in 27 patients and 54 controls from Dorset. And then we did analyze the gene expression in a different set of patients and controls using an entirely different method. This is massive parallel signature sequencing, which is a very fancy name. But what it does is it just simply sequences everything that's present in the samples. With this study, you must know first which sequences you want to look for, and that's how, you, that's how the study is done. You choose the array or you manufacture the array according to what you know about the human genome sequence. With this study, you can sequence anything that's present. And so we can look for novel genes, we can look for virus genes, for example. And this shows some data from the microarray study showing clustering of genes in the 81 individual subjects in that study. So across horizontally, we can see each of the genes. And at a particular fold difference, there were 256 of these. And vertically, we can see the subjects. So that's patients and controls. At the top here, uh, we've got branches. And the length of the branches reflects the similarity of the samples to each other. And red branches indicate chronic fatigue syndrome, and yellow are normals. And the colored pixels here represent upregulation in red, no difference in yellow, and downregulation in blue. And you can see that the red branches indicating CFS patients are very, very similar to each other with respect to expression of these 256 genes. And in most of these cases, there is down regulation. So this is reassuring that the, the, the microarray study is uh, showing um, valid gene differences, that the gene differences identified are actually representative. And we did another type of statistical test called a principal components analysis, which simply indicates the degree of separation of the patients from the normal controls. And these are the patients, and these are the controls. And in this test, there was wide separation. And that's further reassurance that the patients are very different to the normal people with respect 
to expression of these 256 genes. So we then had a gene list for the microarray study and a gene list for the MPSS study. And we overlapped these two to pull out genes that were, that were discovered by both studies. And we've concentrated on 100 human genes, 100 of the most abnormal genes. And what do these genes do? Well, mostly they are involved in the immune response, but other ones are involved in cell regulation or the regulation of different cell processes. And we believe that's significant and important that we choose genes that fit with the known pathogenesis of chronic fatigue syndrome and also reflect its um, multi-organ uh, characteristics. Because all of these regulatory genes occur in many different cell types, many different systems of the body, which allow us the potential to modulate these processes in a variety of body systems. And I think that's going to be important in treatment development. Unfortunately, this didn't come out very well, but this is how we look at the data. And this shows uh, data for uh, gene levels in 10 different genes. Gene levels in chronic fatigue syndrome is shown in the crosshacks bars. In normals, is shown in black. And these seven genes at the start were found by our pilot study and have, com have been confirmed to be abnormal in our repeat study. And these, this group of genes at the end here, these eukaryotic translation initiation factors are all mitochondrial genes. And the mitochondrion produces energy for the cell. And this may be quite significant, the fact that we've got abnormalities in mitochondrial genes in a disease where energy is a problem. So then we looked at virus genes in chronic fatigue syndrome. And we used the data from the MPSS study um, to pull out possible virus involvement. And this produced a list of about 13 or 14 viruses. And when we include those viruses which are known to trigger chronic fatigue syndrome, we, we developed a list of 28. And we're now looking, um, using PCR, for evidence of infection of these 28 microbes in chronic fatigue syndrome patients on normal controls. And finally, as part of our gene studies, we're looking at microRNAs. MicroRNAs are very small uh, RNA sequences of about 22 uh, bases long. And what they do is they regulate other genes. So one microRNA might regulate 300 messenger RNA genes. They have also been developed uh, for treatments for certain virus infections and possibly also for cancers. So this will provide insights, further into insights into the disease mechanisms and may also uh, lead us to particular treatments using these very microRNAs themselves. So at the end of this study, we will have information on the involvement of these 100 human genes involved in the immune response and regulation of cell processes. We'll have information on the uh, levels of transcription of 28 different viruses and bacteria. And we will have some idea of what uh, microRNAs are abnormal in chronic fatigue syndrome. After that, we must confirm that those gene abnormalities are specific to the disease. And we need to test in more patients, in CFS associated with particular infections, as Malcolm said, um, fatiguing syndromes that don't quite reach the criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome or ME, for example, that with a duration of about three months, and then in normal people with a degree of fatigue on the day of sampling. And then we must test in many more normal people as well and in other diseases very significantly to make sure that the genes we find in chronic fatigue syndrome 
the abnormalities are specific to CFS. And then we're going to look in a defined subset of patients with a typical symptom profile and a typical gene expression profile at multiple time points over 12 months and analyze the genes and the symptoms at each of these time points and then compare and see if there's any possible associations between particular gene abnormalities and the presence or absence of particular symptoms. So once this is done, we will have particular insights into the specific disease mechanisms and ongoing infectious processes in our patients. And we then have the opportunity to um, look at these with respect to treatment development. <clears throat> now these must be confirmed, of course, but uh, as are the viruses and their involvement in chronic fatigue syndrome. But from where we stand now, there are a number of possibilities for the future. And these targets are already um, the subject of investigation um, and treatment development to interfere with these pathways. And we know that these antiviral compounds also exist. Our first clinical trial will be using interferon beta, and we're hoping to start that at the end of this year. We've been promised the drug by the, the drug company. Uh, we're in the process of applying for funding to administrate the study. The rationale for using interferon beta is that it is uh, an endogenously produced compound which um, enhances the immune system, particularly for the abnormalities that exist in chronic fatigue syndrome. It enhances natural killer cell function. It uh, pushes the immune response towards a Th1 pattern and away from a Th2. And it's also antiviral as well. It's an established drug. It's been used for some years in multiple sclerosis, and it has a very good safety record. So finally, we're developing a diagnostic test. And we're doing this using an entirely different approach. And this time, we're looking at the presence of proteins in the serum or the blood. And we're using mass spectrometry and a variant of that called cell DPC. And that stands for Surface Enhanced Laser Desorption and Ionization Protein Chip. And what we do here is we fractionate the samples and then we put each fraction onto a variety of these protein chips with a different physical and chemical surface type. And then these are subjected to mass spectrometry and a mass spectrum produced as shown here. And we then compare the profiles, the mass spectra in patients shown in these three top examples. This is not our data, by the way. This is just a hypothetical example to illustrate the method. We compare the patient profiles with the normal people's profiles. And you can see in this example that there are peaks within the dotted lines in the three patients that don't occur in the normal people. And these must then be identified and uh, precisely identified in terms of molecular weight, etc., and can then be developed towards um, incorporation in the diagnostic test. And this may be using the ELISA method, which is a commonly used uh, method in clinical laboratories to measure biochemical um, analytes, to measure antibodies to different infections, et cetera, et cetera. Or we may develop a, a dipstick test, which is more versatile and can be used in a, a hospital laboratory, uh, a patient surgery, uh, a GP surgery, or even an over-the-counter uh, um, test, such as a pregnancy test. So we're doing this in collaboration with the Department of Pediatrics at Imperial College, so we'll be including adults and children in this study. We're taking our patients from 12 different centers in the United Kingdom and two in the USA. 
So I'd like to thank my clinical collaborators, which are listed here. Um, people involved in study design and laboratory work. And particularly David Tyrrell, who was the chairman of the CFS Research Foundation, who died one year ago, who was key to setting up this venture. And the CFS Research Foundation for funding. I also want to thank my uh, team in the laboratory who are uh, a pleasure to work with, very diligent and talented group, uh, Beverly Burke, Robert Petty, and Deepika Devaner. Thank you very much. We are currently looking at messenger RNA predominantly and also proteins for the diagnostic test. We will soon be looking at uh, the DNA sequence as well, but we haven't done that to date. Um, but uh, the CDC have just published some papers using um, um, to identify single nucleotide polymorphisms in chronic fatigue syndrome, and previous twin studies have documented a, a minor genetic component to predisposition, but we haven't done anything with predisposition just yet. Yeah, but, but from the clinical point of view, I'm, I'm a bit concerned of your results show that there's a, there is this genotype. Would that then mean that patients who seem to develop ME symptoms and seem to clinically follow ME, but don't have the gene, genotype that you've discovered, would that mean that they would be not diagnosed as ME, in your opinion? At the moment, what we're doing is we're looking at a large group of patients and a large group of normals pulling out the genes that are different between those. Then we'll test those in other diseases and more patients and normals, and that'll reduce the list still further. We're looking for a gene signature. It's not a genotype per se. A genotype would imply the DNA sequence uh, that predisposes to development of CFS. We're looking for a gene signature, which is a messenger RNA. Yeah, I would con congratulate you <laughs> with very new and um, important approach. The, the problem we have in the clinic with um, ME patient is that they are not sick. They don't have a somatic disease and they don't have a psychiatric disease. They have an energy problem. They are, they are coupled over <coughs> in a low energy state, we think. And the problem we have is that the patients are not allowed to communicate the real, very severe an energy loss. <coughs> I, I think your approach, not looking for a disease gene or an infection, is the right approach. And um, your findings is that um, the, the regulation genes are non-regulated for the mitochondria. Is that right? In, in that particular data set, that's right, yes. And that could perhaps explain the energy problem for the patients. And the immune, if you are in a situation where you're not leaving the home, you, you don't need any immune reaction. So I think the immunological findings is associated with the, uh, with the mitochondrial findings that if you are at home, you don't meet any infections, and then you don't need the T-cell activation and all those parameters. So I think the, the immune system down-regulated and the mitochondria down-regulated is in, in a, 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 a very, very important uh, step. Some of these uh, eukaryotic translation initiation factors, which are the mitochondrial genes, are upregulated. Um, but we believe this is a valid approach, looking at gene, uh, gene signatures, because they do exist in this syndrome, and because of the difficulty in arriving at reproducible uh, differences in other types of studies. You're asking why we're not using something that can be given simply orally uh, as opposed to something which is, needs a needle. Well, it, it's actually subcutaneous, the inter, interferon beta. And the reason for using that, I think the two, the two studies that we're doing broadly are a human gene signature study. We're hoping to arrive at a human gene signature. And then we're looking at individual patients for evidence of virus infection. And I think it depends. It's likely, we believe, that we'll find a human gene signature in chronic fatigue syndrome, either for the whole disease or else a subtype-specific signature or several of those. On the virus side, I think it's much more likely we're going to find individual viruses in individual people.
So I think to say that we would use an antiviral agent like Placonaril in a group of CFS patients probably wouldn't be relevant because some of them may not have that particular enteroviral infection. So the main thrust of the clinical trials will be to use drugs that we can use in a large number of patients. Um, Jonathan, you've, um, as I understand it, you have demonstrated very nicely um, that uh, the genes related to certain immunological processes are more active than they would be in the resting state. I mean, that's putting it in lay terms. Um, and you've demonstrated the immediate um, byproducts of a gene being rendered more active, i.e. the messenger RNA. Um, now, why is it more difficult? Why is, why is it proved so difficult to measure the product further down the line? In other words, the inflammatory mediators of the response that we're looking at. Do you mean to connect the messenger RNA gene studies with the respective protein molecules? That's right, yes. The well, it's known that the, the correlation of messenger RNA levels inside the white blood cells with the protein levels in the serum, which float about freely, the correlation between those is quite poor and maybe as low as 30%. Right. So it's difficult to confirm messenger RNA levels um, in terms of protein levels, because often they don't correlate. I think this is the first of a number of clinical trials that we're going to do, and we are aiming to use drugs which have, all, have been developed for other diseases, and their use in CFS is a novel use, and therefore they've passed safety trials and are known to be safe. In the case of interferon beta, it's an endogenously produced compound. We, we've got that same uh, protein in our bodies already, so... Um... Very nice. Um, just a simple question, actually. We know that in patients with SLE, there's more m women than men, and it's thought due to, perhaps due to the immunological circumstances of that. Did you find any differences in the genes types between men and women? Or did you look for it? We haven't looked for that. <laughs> because what, the way we've designed the study is to match precisely the, um, each individual patient with one or two age and sex matched controls. So at this stage, we're not looking at that.